Member for Burns Beach. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we meet and sit, the Noongar Wajak people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. But before I start my reply and introduction to this place, I must congratulate the member for Albany, the Speaker, on his election, an Australian Olympian in his youth and now the Speaker of Parliament. Again, congratulations. I, acknowledge, I take this opportunity to acknowledge Mr Albert Jacobs, the previous member for Burns Beach, and wish him and his family the best for the future. Mr Speaker, I thank the Governor, Excellency Kerry Sanderson, for her address to the 40th Parliament, and I offer this in her reply. I am a humble man who understands what a great honour it is and privilege it is to stand here tonight. So I think it appropriate I tell you something about my journey into this place. My father was a major in the army. My mother, may she rest in peace, was a nurse. By the virtue of my father's military service as a young child, we travelled throughout Australia, being posted to various cities throughout the East Coast. And as part of these postings, we were transferred to Ley in Papua New Guinea. At the time, I had two younger brothers. One would go on to be a highly successful merchant banker in London. The other would become the chief physical training instructor at the Special Air Service. Whilst in New Guinea, all of our family contracted malaria, which was normal uh, at the time, as the illness was rife in the area. My mother would further develop a further complication, which would lead to her later in life developing paranoid schizophrenia. My mother's illness would have a great impact on my life. It was the cause of my parents' separation and the illness developed would take on a greater role in raising my two younger brothers. This was a challenge at the time, as I was only 11. It was an interesting period for myself. My schooling was spasmodic. Months would go by where I looked after my mother and not attend school. My attendance was so rare, my absence was never really noticed even though I enrolled in some of the best schools in Perth, Aquinas College, Rossmoyne Senior High School, Christchurch Grammar School. But the end result was when I left school, I could not read and write. My literacy was at such a standard, I could not even read a newspaper. I'm not sure to this day whether my father pulled a few strings or whether the military felt sorry for me. But I ended up doing a short hitch in the army. While serving, I was able to teach myself how to read and developed an insatiable appetite for the written word. On leaving the army, I spent a couple of years at night school learning how to, accept, uh, how to write to an acceptable standard and pass the police entrance exam. That was challenging. I commenced my policing career in June 1990 and graduated on December 24, 1990 and was posted to the Subiaco Police Station. I remember working Christmas Day and whilst attending my very first police job, I became subject to a ministerial complaint. <laughs> I laugh at it now, but perhaps it was a sign of my future for career. For the next 27 years, was spent on the police front line, always in the mud, the blood and the beer. I was always in the thick of it. My service took me all over the state. I served in Northern, Eucla, and returned to Perth and served in the original vehicle crime unit. Our government spoke during the election of empowering our police to be able to force vehicles involved in high-speed pursuits off the road. I remember doing this 20 years ago. We were chasing a stolen motor along Morley Drive around 180 kilometres an hour at 3am in the morning. I watched the vehicle sail through the Tonkin Highway intersection at over 200 kilometres an hour and looking to my partner, who was later killed in a police plane crash and saying, why are we doing this? He responded, if we, keep, if we don't keep going, there's no one else out here to stop them. If we don't stop them, they're going to kill someone. On that night, they got away. A couple of nights later, we weren't on the road and an innocent victim was killed. 
After finishing my time at the Vehicle Crime Unit, I went on to serve with the armed robbery squad. I spent the next couple of years working in, nor in the northern suburbs before I was seconded, seconded to the Australian Federal Police and served in East Timor during the Troubles. I was there for the presidential elections and independence. There's nothing like running a multiple homicide investigation with no resources other than a notebook and a pencil in your top pocket to teach you how to keep perspective. On my return to Western Australia, I was posted to the Calberry Police Station, where I was the officer in charge. I received numerous commendations and was a finalist in Police Officer of the Year. I was promoted to Sergeant and transferred to the Wagen Police Station before returning to Perth. I've served a couple of places in Perth, including as a senior trainer at the Police Academy and at Internal Affairs before finishing my last couple of years at the Morley Police Station. So you may ask, what would motivate a police officer with a successful career to make a decision to stand for parliament? Well, it's simple. A couple of years ago, I was called to a job. A little old lady was trapped inside her home. After not being able to get inside, I forced entry to the address. Once inside, I saw Nonna pointing to a room I followed her direction and found her partner laying on the floor. Realising that the man was critically ill, I dragged him from his room and started resuscitation on him immediately. I was joined a short time later by our fantastic ambulance officers who took over from me. Mr Speaker, seeing a loved one being resuscitated is a very frightening thing. As a result of seeing Nonna so scared, I took her aside, I took her away from the events as you can see. I spoke to Nonna for about 20 minutes. Through a broken language, I found out that the night before, her husband had complained of minor chest pains. But the last time they went to hospital, they waited over eight hours before being sent home. And because of this wait, they made the decision that they wait till morning. Mr Speaker, Papa didn't make it till morning. I was so angry, so enraged, I had to walk away. As a police officer, you cannot ring the Minister of the Crown. It is a breach in regulations. I wanted to. As a matter of fact, the health department, as the health, was a health department issue, the police command would not be interested. It was not the first time I'd encountered adverse situations from poor government. Mr Speaker, the decisions that we make in this house have real consequences that affect real people. And sometimes it's life and death. We must never forget that. As a result, I continued to sit on the, I could, if I continued to sit on the fence, I would end up with a sword behind. So as a result, I vowed I would never, I would do whatever I could to be never put in that position again. So here I am. I wanted to talk about domestic violence, but I've seen, intervened so much over the years, it is so fresh in my mind uh, including some very recent homicides, I could not talk to this assembly without becoming too emotional. This issue is raw with me. I feel that I would be compelled to evidence and criticise our courts for their impotence, the West Australian police for its attitude towards the domestic violence and the incompetence of our child protection and the betrayal of the women and children of our community and by these institutions. But however, I feel today is not the time for this conversation, as I'd never want to stand behind parliamentary privilege to hide my criticisms. I feel it would be cowardice not to show the due respect of the brave victims of domestic violence. But I will not shy away from this issue, and I will continue working hard to rid our state of this horrible scourge. I wish to raise the issue of post-traumatic stress in our first responders. 
Over many years of service, I have seen many close friends crippled by this affliction. During the election campaign, a friend and colleague of mine felt the need to take her own life. I won't particularise the circumstance, but I can assure you, I do not, not know a police colleague who has seen the service that I've seen, nor uh, not be afflicted by this hideous condition. As recently as five years ago, the police commissioner refused to acknowledge that his, work face was, well, his workforce was troubled by PTSD. I note that the St John Ambulance and our fire service have a similar uncaring attitude to their employees. I have the condition, I would not wish it upon anybody. I find it difficult to go to funerals of colleagues who have suffered from PTSD because there's just been too many. But I'm the lucky one because I'm comfortable talking about it and there are many first responders who are not. And as for them, I raise this issue in the House. We are indebted to these individuals for they do our biddings but a great cost to themselves and to their families. We as a community have an expectation that our first responders will go into harm's way for our family, for our safety. And Mr Speaker, they do it without hesitation, without question, time and time again. But it is the price that our first responders pay. It doesn't matter if you're a firefighter, a copper, a paramedic, a state emergency service volunteer, all of them in time will succumb. So what do we do? It's my belief we need to develop an institution of mental health excellence to help, our great, to help treat our injured workers. And just as importantly, able to undertake research into the illness so that our heroes can gain some normality in life and excellent in treatment. We need to compensate the injuries for, as PTSD is an injury. The World Health, World Health Organisation recognises that PTSD is the equivalent of having a physical injury that leaves you paraplegic. I have witnessed this and I agree with the analogy. We need to keep in mind that this illness is some ways like an illness of addiction and that you never completely recover from it. But you learn to manage and develop strategies within yourself to deal with the dark days. The worst thing about this illness is the hidden cost, the price the loved ones, the families, and those that care about their family members pay. How can we quantify a price or put a value on it? The broken families, the divorce, and those that have taken their lives. And lastly, we need to accept these individuals as part of our workplace. We need to accept them for who they are, not what they become. Mr Speaker, they are heroes. We must not walk away from them. I have another passion I must air in this place, and that is our state's road toll. The last three decades, I have witnessed the growing tragedy gr occurring on our roads within our great state. I have attended too many fatal crash scenes. I've gone to too many homes to do the death knock. I have told mums and dads that their sons and daughters will not be coming home. And perhaps others in this assembly have had the misfortune to do this. And to them, I give a nod of respect, for they know what a dark day, a bad day is. To illustrate my argument, I'll only go back the last 10 years. 2006, 201 persons were killed on our roads. In 2007, it was 235. 2008, 205. 2009, 191. 2010, 192. 2011, 179. 2012, 183. 2013, 161. 2014, 182. 2015, 161. And last year, 195 persons were killed on our roads. The total, 1,885 lives. Put in stark terms, our road toll is greater than the sum of all deaths in the Korean, 
Vietnam and Afghanistan wars combined. Western Australia's road toll is worse than that of Kenya, a third world country. And I cannot begin to understand and to quantify the human cost, the pain and suffering the families have gone through, but I've seen the tears in their eyes and worse. I have read many studies to try to understand what the financial cost to our community is. Some of these studies estimate a single road death between two and $15 million. Some studies estimate, wrong. In my view, the most credible studies tend to put the cost around $8 million per person per death. Based on the dollar cost to WA for last year's road toll was over $1.5 billion. Mr Speaker, this figure is triple to $4.5 billion if we to include those who were totally and permanently incapacit incapacitated in this fiscal challenging time. It is unconscionable that the profile of our road carnage is not higher in our community safety agendas and priorities. I do not know, I know from personal experience, there are four main causes to our road toll. The poor condition of our roads, the poor training of our young drivers and road users, poor legislation, poor police doctrine that enforces, in, uh, sorry, poor police doctrine and enforcement where an electronic infringement carries more value than direct officer interactions. When it comes to our community, 80% of the fat fatalities could be stopped if our road verges were cleared out of vegetation, 80%. Three greater blades from the carriageway. To put it simply, if a car runs off the road, hits a tree, or rolls over, a person dies. Mr Speaker, can I have another 10 minutes? Extension granted. Thank you. Clear the road verges out, reduces the deaths. It's not hard. Most of our country road tolls are the responsibility of local government. We as a state government might, I suggest, have a responsibility to develop creative, imaginative, secure revenue streams to local government that are quarantined. Some of these creative ideas could possibly be levies on registration, driver's licence, or more controversially, we could consider allowing fixed uh, speed cameras, multi-nova cameras, and point-to-point -point speed measuring devices and quarantine the revenue from them for our road maintenance re-engineering so, so that they are safer. Some would say this is revenue raising. I would say absolutely it is. But Mr Speaker, if it saves one life, then it's a small price to pay. Some in Parliament would say we, need to, we should use the Road Trauma Trust Fund. There are numerous mentions in Hansard regarding the lack of these, use of these funds. At what point did our road toll have to get to before it was used? I look to the previous government and say nothing. When it comes to our young drivers, there's not a professional first responder who does not believe having parents teaching kids to drive is a flawed process. Effectively, we are allowing poor drivers to teach our young drivers their poor habits. We have a significant proportion of our road tollers made up of individuals who are under the age of 25, and the majority of them having been taught by their parents. Our current system relies on 25 hours of driving, sitting a test, passing it, and another 25 hours, which basically means we are giving our kids 50 hours of supervised driving by unqualified driving instructors who can't necessarily drive themselves. Again, poor driver, reinforcing poor driver habits to our young influential youth. We're setting our kids up to join the road toll. I believe given, give our children 40 hours of proper driver instruction by qualified driver instructors, we will see a significant reduction of youths in our road toll. Some in this house would cry the cost. The cost, my comment to them is simple. 
It's a minor increase in the proper driver education versus the death of your child. Well, if that's too personal, then look at it at the $1.5 billion last year's deaths cost our community. Mr Speaker, Madam Speaker, the cost of the Labor Day long weekend carnage last year alone was $80 million. When is this going to stop? In conclusion, I'd like to thank the following people. My fantastic wife, our daughter Gillian, our son Adrian, my great unwavering stepmum, Leslie, my father, Michael Folkard, my father-in-law, Graham Cook, my brothers, Stuart, Brett, and without their tireless support, I would not be here today. I would like to thank the electors of Burns Beach, for I have one aim in this parliament, and that is to be the best local member, my constituents, and represent them, no matter what their background is, to the best of my ability for the benefit of our community. I would like to thank the Australian Manufacturers Workers Union and its members, organisers and staff for their support during the election campaign. I would also like to thank the CFMEU for their contribution. I would also like to thank the Australian Labor Party for having faith in me. I would further like to thank Robert Knox, my campaign manager, Rebecca Doyle, Jake Whitney, my field organisers, Rory Cummings, Sue and Kim Young, who form my campaign team. I'd further like to thank Senator Louise Pratt, Ann Alley, MP, Martin Pritchard, MLC, and Ken Travis for their support and advice. And finally, I'd like to thank my volunteers, who are too num numerous to list. I'd also like to thank Steve McCartney, the State Secretary of the AMWU, for his belief in me and friendship. And finally, I'd like to thank John Ford, Sally Talbot, MLC. John and Sally have been my steadying hand throughout this recent election, and they have become my mentors and dear friends and I cannot thank them enough. Finally, my dear mates, Matt, Snowy, Dave, Glenn, Louie, Cheryl, Michelle, Tennille and Pete, take care and may your God go with you.